Well, here we are again for uh, another study together, and uh, it's just a great, great opportunity and privilege to be able to uh, to do this together in, in this unique way, strange way, uh, new for me in front of a camera. Uh, this has been uh, certainly a learning experience for me for these last six months, and uh, one I know for all of you as we're getting used to doing more things through Facebook and YouTube and all these other different kinds of modes and methods. So uh, we're going to be in uh, the book of Acts, chapter 1. We're going to consider uh, verses 24 through 26, which uh, it really is, is kind of an interesting passage in, in the book of Acts. And, and I, hope, uh, I hope you see how interesting at least I find it, and, and hopefully you will also find it very interesting. So uh, let's, let's turn our hearts to the Lord and get ready to hear his word. Oh, we ask, O oh Lord, the same voice and spirit who spoke these words and uh, who animated the lives that they represent, I pray that you, Holy Spirit, would grant understanding and clarity to our thinking and apply to our lives uh, rightly and appropriately uh, your word uh, to our circumstances and situation today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so in, in Acts uh, chapter 1, verse starting in verse 24, now keep in mind, uh, Peter has uh, recognized the importance of having 12 disciples, apostles, that corresponds to the 12 tribes of Israel. And so these last few days we've been looking at, uh, you know, the, a longer portion uh, of Scripture that explains all these events, you know, as Peter's stands up and recognizes uh, starting in verse 15, and we looked all through this. We looked at the the, um, the suicide of Judas and the suffering he endured as the consequence of his uh, unrepentant uh, condition and rebelling against Jesus and handing him over. And, and we looked in last time about uh, the qualifications uh, of the candidates that were to be considered for uh, Judas's replacement among the 12, and now we actually get to the point of them uh, discerning, not using the word decide, discerning who it is the replacement is, is to be. And so, verse 24, And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry, and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. I'm referring this to this as uh, dependent discernment. And, and, you know, I wonder what criteria, what a process do you go through when you are seeking to make a decision? You know, are you the way the pros and cons? Uh, are you one who just kind of wings it and goes with your with your gut? Are you one who sits down and uh, gathers counsel from people that you trust? Uh, you know, as as a leader in in the church, you know, it's interesting when you work with other leaders and and those responsible for uh, making decisions, you know, it's it's not always an easy process. It's not always a neat process to make decisions in the church. It's not always a neat process to make decisions in our workplaces or our homes. And certainly, as we are on the brink here in November, uh, trying to make a decision of who our elected officials will be. And and we've, we've tried to, as human beings, to come up with uh, processes that are uh, fair and that are safe and that are um, trustworthy and yet uh, we still are the ones who create these systems and and uh, as such uh, the things that we create although maybe functional and good they are not always uh, airproof and perfect you know, there's loopholes, there's questions, there's things that arise. And so 
what did the disciples do? What did these gather together do in order to uh, embody what I'm calling dependent discernment? I mean, they really are in the process of trying to determine and, and uh, decide who is going to be Judas's replacement. But notice that it isn't just a decision they are making. They, they pray. That's the first thing they do. They pray. They seek the Lord. They ask the Lord not only for his counsel and for his leading and guiding, but they pray that God would be the one to decide, not them. That's what they said. You, Lord, uh, who know the hearts of all. God's knowledge is exceedingly perfect, higher greater, more exhaustive than our knowledge. Show which one of these two you have chosen. So give them clarity, discernment, about the one that God has selected and the one you've chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And so to, who have you chosen, Lord, to replace Judas in a role God you have created, you rule and reign over, you are sovereign and providential over, and uh, in a sense implied here in their prayer is, and Lord, we long that it would be someone a faithful, dependable, trustworthy, and true, unlike Judas who, what did he do? When a side turned aside to go to his own place. He was driven by self-will. He was driven by an agenda. He was driven by a, a self-centeredness that was thereby not humble enough to relent, uh, to cooperate, and to um, coalesce in a depending, a dependent discernment. And so they're basically asking God, choose the person you have, and we long that this person would be a godly person, not a self-centered person. And so they, they plead in prayer to God. And I think that's the really the first category of uh, and first condition of uh, this uh, dependent discernment is it is not driven by self. It's not driven by the individual or the even the individuals and the personalities of the group. It is driven by a God-centeredness. And that really, I think, is the first important thing when it comes especially to church decisions in church among God's people and believers is that we, we really be focused not on ourselves but on the Savior. And so they plead in prayer. The second thing is they... they and entrust the deciding work to God. This is what I really uh, find striking, is they use the practice called casting lots. It says, verse uh, 26, and they cast lots for them. Now, what this means, some people say roll the dice, and it kind of has that in mind, but, but what usually this meant was uh, they would either uh, draw sticks with different... Uh, uh, names assigned to the length but to cast lots here really meant to have a, a maybe a bag or a, a container full of stones and they might roll them they might draw out of the bowl but what they do is they trust that god will work in such a way that whatever name turns up through the rolling of the the stones or the pulling out of the bowl that that is the one. Now, we might think that this is crazy. We might say, oh, you're leaving it up to chance. But that that means, that kind of idea of saying you're leaving it up to chance uh, does not have a robust and comprehensive appreciation for God's invested and in intimate involvement in the creation, what we call providence, God's active hand in the affairs of human history and all the way down to the minutia that God is invested and involved. And so uh, it, it, to call it chance 
is to uh, strip God of his involvement. And so they would not say this is leaving it up to chance. They would say they're leaving it up to God. And whatever is revealed in the casting of the lots is God's will. Now, what is significant about this? <clears throat> it means that they are not relying upon internal uh, things. They were not dependent on internal realities. They are dependent on external realities. In other words, if you've ever been in a meeting and a decision is being made and debate ensues, disagreement ensues, maybe arguing ensues, and there, there really seems to be two or three or maybe even more perspectives and sides that are uh, almost irre irreconcilably at odds with one another. Well, what do you do? Well, the cause of that is because people have dug their heels in the sand. They, they are uh, so um, fixed and firmly uh, committed to what they want. What, and what they want is determined and driven by them. It is internally dependent. And to cast the lots means that we are placing our dependence in something outside of ourselves. <clears throat> it, it, to roll the stones or to pick out the stick is to say, God, we are trusting you to decide and we will live with and accept the results of this process. <clears throat> and so it is trusting that God would guide the lot, the stone, the stick, the dice, the whatever, that God would guide it to the one he has chosen. And so this is not a vote by popularity. This is not a vote or decision based upon personal preference or agenda. This is leaving the decision up to God. And oh, how we continue to need that. Um, we, uh, I mean, not to get uh, too involved in current hot button realities, but we are a tremendously divided nation right now. We're divided over issues of police support or support of those who seemingly uh, uh, appear to be horribly mistreated by the police. And so are you picking the side of the authorities or those abused by the authorities? <clears throat> we have the uh, red and blue. We have Democrat and Republican, liberal and conservative. We have Trump supporters. We have Biden supporters. We have all these lines of division. <clears throat> and those divisions are based, I'm going to paint in very broad brushstrokes, but the cause of division in our world is our commitment to self-will, self-agenda, uh, not a commitment, uh, maybe in uh, conceptually thinking, <clears throat> not a commitment to the greater good. And certainly uh, the rampant divisiveness in our nation is rooted in the fact that we are not committed to God's good. And so what what do we need to do? What would benefit us? <clears throat> I will say, um, speaking hopefully to people that trust and know Jesus Christ, we as the church need to embody and practice a God-dependent, discerning approach to our decisions, to our planning, to our organizing, to the, our way of life. We need to be even more God-centered and God-dependent, and we need to allow that to show outwardly in our lives every day, the way we live our everyday lives, though so not just our uh, lives inside the confines of the body of Christ, but that it would pervade and uh, saturate every area of our life, that we would display what a God-dependent, God-centered, discerning way of life is. And that may not affect uh, widespread change and transformation in our culture, but it is a means by which we can proclaim and declare the saving grace and mercy of Jesus Christ and then begin to act for the good that God decides, discerns, declares, 
and wills for us. So let us pray. God, help us to get over ourselves and especially those that believe you and trust you. And I ask, Lord, that you would lead and guide us, that you would enable us to uh, live as uh, dependent discerners of your will and to trust, oh God, that you will accomplish your plans and purposes. And we pray most of all for the lost, the hurting, and especially the widespread brokenness and division in our culture. We know, Jesus, that you are the only answer for that. And I pray that you would not only manifest that in us as your people, but through us to the world. For your glory and praise, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for being with me. I know it went a little longer than usual. Uh, uh, make sure that you share this. And I pray that this message would take deep root in our minds and in our hearts. I think uh, while it may not be the the uh, expressed in the clearest and, and, and simplest of terms, I think the, the, the heart of, of what's going on here and the, the discerning of Matthias as the replacement of Judas, there's great lessons here that if we really laid hold of them and embodied, embraced them, that they could reverberate in great transformation and perhaps even a wave of revival in the church for sure and beyond the walls of the church, beyond the, the bounds of the body of Christ to touch the lost and hurting world around us. Uh, may the Lord be with you, and I'll see you again tomorrow.